I think he was known for being a really good showman. Lah. He was a very good frontman. Well, like, he was very charismatic on stage. Mm -hmm. He always knew how to like rile up a crowd. Everyone would always uh, definitely talk about The Boys because for his stature, it's unexpected. You don't think you know that's going to come out of him. The rapport that he generates with crowds never seen anything like it. I think it's like you know most people think that he's not much better shirt lah, and uh, <laughs> that's one of the things that I find like cool about him. Everybody loves him, and I'm just saying, God, you never grew up with this guy. <laughs>
So whenever we fought, when we were both drunk, it would just be really just senseless fighting and it would just go on. So we'll enjoy the first hour of the night and then the next five hours will just be just really just yelling and fighting over nothing. And then the next day I'd wake up and go to work and he'd not go to work because he'd be hungover or whatever. I was, I was putting up walls for my on my own. Like it wasn't any influence from her part. It wasn't influence from my family or, or, or the band. I just kept pulling up these weird boundaries between us yeah. and people. How much did the alcohol play a part in that? All of it. Everything. All of it. Because it's... Like, we won't don't... fight when we're sober. Yeah. I think the first time I realised that there was an issue was very early on when we were dating because we were drinking at Cascaden and everything was amazing having a great time. He goes to the bathroom, he comes back, and then completely changed. Yeah. Everyone told me like, hey, just like that, why are you so angry all of a sudden, you know? It's like from me singing Bohemian Rhapsody on the table of Mogambo, suddenly I'm outside Mogambo's angry at the world. Jill was also telling me a lot uh, that I wasn't aware of, was constantly fighting, breaking up, making up. In some cases, uh, really, hardcore fight, so I knew there was a problem there. But he doesn't want to listen to his father. He doesn't want to talk to his father. So there was not a whole lot that I could do to help the guy. I always wanted to tell him the past and the current way of life is going to catch up with you at some point. I don't want to wait for regret. Every little chance that I get makes me feel like I have to choose between this life or this threat. And if I'm not wrong, we had jamming that night. If I remember correctly, we had uh, practice that night and I basically I woke late again. When I went to Cheers, as I went into Cheers, like Martin was in Cheers. So I was like, oh, hey, what are you doing here? He's like, hey, uh, bro, we just, uh, we want to talk to you. Uh, you got five minutes, we are all over there. So I was like, oh, okay. That caught me a little bit off guard. So I went, I went to, I, I crossed the street and they were all there and they basically said like, uh, we just want to let you know, you know, things haven't been the same. You know, something's been up with you and we're going to carry on the band without you lah. So, that was what happened oh. When that night happened, like, part of me was actually relieved at, because I was already like planning to, you know, tell them that, you know, I just want to like chill for a while, I want to take a break. But, I mean, these are guys that I knew for like, like a decade, you know, almost a decade or more, more even. So, that just turned into rage and anger and being angry at them and having a lot of resentment. We headed to Orchard Towers one night and I think there was a fight going on there. And we sort of got into an altercation uh, with... It, it was just like a verbal altercation, I think, with... Th this is what happened from what I recall, with another group. As we were leaving, some cops came to screen because they heard there was an altercation. And they obviously saw me and I'm covered in ink, right? So what happened was they, they, they screened me, I got angry. I started scolding them, you know, obviously I was being very vulgar with them and because I was being very vulgar they were like no this is not acceptable arrest this fella so they arrested me I was like you know what like yeah fuck it lah arrested arrested you know arrest me and I as I was going out I for some reason I don't know why decided lah I was like yeah I'm just gonna try and hit this guy so I turned around and need one of the officers in his groin and that's when they pinned me and I was like okay this is it lah the next thing I knew I woke up uh, I think it was like the next day in like Tanglin HQ division in, in a padded cell like a solitary padded cell because apparently I was violent and uh, yeah man that was like the big thing that happened to me back then <laughs> the night I found out he was arrested uh, he was just put into the lockup actually he was pretty incoherent at that point so um, I got my phone call I called my dad and I, I just when, I, when he answered, I said, Look, I'm sorry, I got arrested last night. I really fucked up. And you know what, I really deserve this. You don't, you don't need to come and get me. At that point, I told him, you, you know, you have to deal with this. I can't. You got yourself into this mess. You got to get yourself out of it. Now, if there's any way I can help, we're all here to help. And he didn't say anything but don't worry, we love you, just hang in there. That's all he said. And I think that that was like the one line that really just came down on me like a ton of bricks. Like I was like, what the fuck am I doing? You know, I was just like, shit. <laughs> it was like, 
I mean, I don't, be- I don't believe in God anymore, but like, that was like a very prodigal son moment, you know what I mean? And that just like, hit me la. I was like, you know, for such a stern dude, like, you would expect him to be like, yeah, just fucking rotten there, right? But like, he still managed to make me feel at ease with myself when I was locked up. I think my priorities already had changed before prison because I quit drinking the night I got arrested. And as soon as I got arrested, uh, I was like, that, that, that this is it, la. you know, I've hit rock bottom. There's only like two ways this can turn out. Either I carry on and I eventually off myself or, you know, I just stop all this bullshit and continue. Uh. So, uh, continue to do, I mean, not continue to do better, but to do better. After I came out from prison, I just really didn't want to like play music. I just wanted to cut hair and focus on work lah. But that's also because like, I think there's still a lot of emotional baggage attached to the music I was listening to. And uh, it took a while for me to, to, to feel it again. But eventually I did feel it again. And uh, I, I've, I've always wanted to do like a more stripped down acoustic folk sort of uh, style of music. And uh, I guess that was like my gateway into music a- again, where I felt like, oh, I feel a little bit more like better doing this. Like it was almost cathartic, you know, like it's a, it was a release from everything that has happened. A lot of people say like, oh, wow, do you feel like, you know, like a big part of your personality had been taken away. But uh, to be honest, like, no, because I sort of like, the shock, this shock actually like, ended up being the next big important thing in my life, you know? Because people started to actually, you know, know me for something else. And that's giving a good haircut. So, in a sense, like, I lost something and I gained something else. So, that was good. Yeah, man. Deadweight was an acoustic song that I wrote in my bedroom before I went to prison, just mucking around with the acoustic guitar. And uh, I just wrote the chorus. I, I wrote it when I was still quite pissed off with the band, my old band, and uh, with Karakel and uh, the lyrics, I think you can sort of tell for themselves, you know, it's about a bunch of people, you know, laughing at someone for going, like, you know, falling down instead of helping him up. So it kind of spoke to me a lot, lah, I mean, and I think it, it still does, uh, but in a very different light. There was a lot of word already going around, like, wow, Casey is so different now, Casey is so different now. And I think the first person who actually, like, reached out to me was uh, Jude, uh, when he was still in the band. And he needed a haircut, and he came to the shop, he got a haircut, and he was like, oh, dude, you're so different. And we just ended up talking, lah. And I, I guess from there, he went back to them, and, you know, he's like, well, Casey is doing well, you know, he's doing well for himself, and stuff like that. I think when we came into this, we all knew that we sort of like had our life responsibilities to deal with, right? We're not gonna like put down everything and then say like, yeah, we can go on tour and like, you know, just drop our full-time jobs and like whatnot. I mean, when I first started this, I was in uni and I was like, and he was working already and I think Luke was also in school. So we were like, we, we, we made it very clear lah. So I think it's very true in that sense whereby he says that this is very much a passion project. He fell down. Uh, when I was in prison, uh, I was about midway done and I had this dream that I just, we both uh, had a little girl and she was in a white dress and had curly hair. And that was like, it was just a random dream that I had. Her. Yeah, the first thing he was like, if we have a daughter, can we name her Lily? Yeah. And I'm like, why? And then I had a dream and all this da 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 da. And this was the first time that he on his own, he was making in my opinion, plans for the future. Lah. Like he would never, ever, we were together for yeah. five years. I think it was, yeah, a sign that he was looking toward the future, even though it was like a random dream, it did give him something to work towards. So that was cool. I was, I was pretty sure that once he went in, he would come out a changed person, without a doubt. I didn't know how long it would take, but the fact that they let him out early on work release, without a tag surprised me. The biggest change since he got out of prison is one that impacts me. I now have a son. I don't know how else to say it. 
because up until that point, he was anything but a son. You know, I'm far from what I think it's a model son, but but I think that in some way, like even though like I I, I went through like you could say hell and back, uh, I think I did make him really proud. Having a wife and a and a kid and <laughs> a family to feed, you know, I think that is the biggest change that has been in my life from uh, worrying about what to do on stage and and rock out like right now is like worrying if I'm gonna make enough money to put food on the table you know and uh, watching my daughter grow up I think that should be the biggest thing in my life right now man the, the alcohol sort of gave me a persona and, and stuff like that on stage which you know some people liked a lot and uh, obviously that turned a little bit back down the road but uh Playing sober now, it, I'm a lot more conscious now because now I actually want people to, you know, listen to what I'm saying more than what I'm doing on stage. And I think that's important. Lah. It'll be my fifth time playing Bay Beats and it's going to be Sanita's first time playing. I mean, it's dope because it's their 20th anniversary and I'm playing it. Lah. I'd rather just put out music that is going to make me and the rest of the guys in the band happy. And, you know, music that when we play live, we feel shook, and that's it. Uh. <laughs>